I have never had so much trouble trying to tie a bracelet onto my wrist. Okay, no, we can do this. We can do this. Is that good enough? Will that stay all video? Good, yeah, very cute. Good, good spending habits, Sarah. Picked out a great one in Chile. Chi chi chi, le le le, vive Chile. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah and welcome back to Freshly Read Books. I am so excited to film this video. So excited, in fact, I actually filmed it twice. I mean, I'm currently filming it the second time. Yeah, something happened to my original footage for this video, but we'll talk more about that later. I mean, honestly, what's another week or two considering this video I wanted to do forever ago? But let's not dwell on any of that. Let's instead forget our problems and head to Chile. Not actually head there, of course, because there's still the pandemic at large. At large. <laughs> we'll get you one day, coronavirus. One day but instead we'll be traveling there through books and food and maybe even an adult beverage. No, am I kidding? Definitely an adult beverage. I literally have one in my hand right now, so. <laughs> so basically I'm going to be breaking this video up into four different parts. We're going to talk about food, drinks, books, and also my experience in Chile because I actually happen to have already been to Chile before. It's kind of hilarious that my series of reading around the world where I'm supposed to be experiencing new and different cultures to my own is starting in a place that I've already been to, but whatever. That was up to Instagram and fate to decide. So I'm washing my hands of that decision. However, if you want to just hear about the books and you wanna jump straight to that, I totally understand. I get it, this is a book YouTube channel uh, and there will be timestamps so you can jump straight to the parts that you want to see if you'd like. I would just like to say though, please stay till the end of the video if you want to see what country I could possibly be traveling to next as I will be randomly picking from the list of countries that I've got two countries and then those two countries are gonna be on Instagram and they'll be voted on and then of those I'll go to one of them. So it's exciting because at the end of the video you find out where I might be going next. <laughs> I actually already know what happens during that time because I, as I said, filmed this video already. And luckily that small portion of the video, uh, randomly picking the next countries or possible countries, uh, and also the outro of the video is almost all that I have left from when I originally filmed this because I actually filmed it after what happened to the rest of the footage. So I'll still be using that footage from when I originally shot that portion of the video because then you'll be able to see my actual reaction to picking those countries. But I'm not gonna tell you until then, so you'll have to stay till the end of the video. You're not getting this secret out of me, no matter how hard you try. You can't, you're a camera. All right, let's talk food. So I wanted to do a traditional Chilean dish, of course, and I found pastel de choclo, which is what I ended up making. The footage of me making this was definitely the most upsetting thing for me to lose because I can sit down here and just say the same words that I said the first time. Again, that's fine. But losing me actually making a dish that took quite a while for me to make was upsetting. I oddly do still have one picture from it because when I was filming I accidentally took a picture at one point when I meant to start recording so that's the only thing that survived at all from that from any of the other footage that I lost. But anyways because it did take so long to make I decided that I would just make something else for doing it this time around. It gives me an opportunity to try something else although okay technically this is something I've had before we'll talk about that in a second but I still wanted to talk about my thoughts on pastel de choclo since I did make it Curtis and I did eat it and so I, you know, I still have thoughts even though you can't see me making it. So pastel de choclo is a beef and corn dish, but it can also have like a lot of other things thrown in. I went ahead and made like the most basic version of this recipe and I think if I were to do it again I would like to add some of the things in that are often added in. Reading into it online I saw that it's oftentimes compared to like a type of shepherd's pie, but even still, I can't make the exact version of it here just because there's a type of corn, choclo, that's used in it and I didn't have access to that here at least. I saw that there are some places that you can find frozen choclo in like grocery stores, South American grocery stores that are in the US, but I was unfortunately unable to find it for this video. That's okay though because the website that I used still had a method of using our North American corn to make the topping for it just by adding in some cornstarch so it's at least a little bit more the texture it's supposed to be but the biggest difference is that 
the version that I'm able to make is sweeter than the version that is traditionally made because chokwe is not as sweet as North American corn. Oh, also I'll be leaving links to the recipes that I used in the description and like to basically anything I reference. So if you need any of that information, it'll be down there. Overall, I liked the dish. I didn't love it. Like I said, if I were to make it again, I would probably add other things to it besides what's just like the traditional base of it. It was good, it just wasn't like anything spectacular and that's probably because it was just the base of it. Also one of the things that kind of threw me off the most was just how sweet it was, so I'm sure that if I were to actually have this with the real choclo that it's supposed to have that I would like it a little bit more, but overall I still liked it. We you know, ate all the leftovers because I made a lot of it and uh, Curtis enjoyed it as well. We ended up mixing it with like a few different hot sauces and things and that was fun to do because it was so basic that we were able to add a lot of other items to it. So overall, still a win, but uh, it just wasn't something I liked enough to make again, particularly for this video, particularly knowing that I still wouldn't be able to get choclo. All right, let's get to some footage that I actually have of me making something for this. So I ended up deciding to make pebre, which is similar to Mexican pico de gallo, and I actually had a lot while I was in Chile, so I already know that I like it. It's kind of one of those starters that just automatically comes out before your meal and, with some bread, and then you can eat that, and it's, you know, free of charge. There's, there's nothing additional for getting that, kind of like when you get chips and salsa from like a Mexican restaurant in the U.S., you just get pebre and bread. Chilean bread. It's very good, but I know that it's not a full meal like the pastel de choclo was, but I really liked it when I was there and I wanted to make some for the Super Bowl, which for me is tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to getting to taste that again and having something that we can serve for the three people that will be here, including us. It'll be us and one other person. <laughs> I'd like to say though, I also added another beverage to that portion of this video in order to make up for the fact that I am essentially just doing a starter now for this video instead of a full-blown meal. So originally the beverage section was only going to have one drink in it, now it's gonna have two. Just talking about beverages made me want another drink. So Pebre actually originates from Spain, which I was surprised to find out. Um, but came over to Chile in the 18th century. So I definitely think that it counts as like traditional Chilean and that I can use it for this video despite it not originally coming from Chile. Just let me have this, all right? I just want to eat pebre. Also, I apologize for my pronunciation of anything and my ability to sometimes roll my R's and sometimes miserably fair, fail at it. Wow, I can't even speak English, so like, what are you expecting from me here? Okay, so I'm gonna turn this over to voiceover Sarah, who's going to walk you through the recipe and also let you know how I liked the specific recipe that I made for this because I haven't actually made it yet. But obviously I know I'm gonna like it, so take it away, voiceover Sarah. Thanks, video Sarah. You may notice my audio is better for this portion. Turns out my mic was dead in that video as it was in my previous upload because they were filmed on the same day. But after this, things should be back to my regular quality. So for the pebre sauce, you're going to take two large tomatoes, a medium onion, mine's a little big, but I don't use all of it, a jalapeno, one clove of garlic. I use two because the cloves I have left on this bulb are small and I typically double garlic in recipes anyways, and honestly, I could have used more in this recipe. Red wine vinegar, olive oil, it should be Chilean olive oil, but I couldn't find any, and salt and pepper. Also cilantro, which I didn't mention, but will show later because Curtis hates cilantro, so I wasn't adding it into the whole thing, just to my portion. So first you'll peel and dice the tomatoes. I peeled mine with a knife because I didn't want to go through the whole boiling it till the skins fall off, but you can do that and it is laid out in the recipe that I used. It's in the description. I put those aside into a bowl and peeled and diced the onion. I put some of that onion in the bowl with the tomatoes and then set aside some more just in case I wanted to add more later. I didn't and instead ended up saving the rest of those diced onions for future recipes. Then I peeled the garlic to prep it for the garlic press. You can also mince these if you want. Next, I put on a glove to dice up the jalapeno so that I didn't get any lingering spiciness on my hands. The recipe calls for taking the seeds and the core out, but you could probably keep them in for a spicier pebre. Then I threw those into the bowl and moved the cutting board out of the way. Also, watch me really struggle with throwing away the sticker from the tomato. Okay, back to the bowl. 
Here's a cilantro I like to use since only one of us eats it in this house. I sprinkled some of this in my bowl when I separated this up for Curtis and myself. So I pressed the garlic from earlier into the bowl and stirred that up. Remember you can mince this instead if you don't have a garlic press. Then I measured out a tablespoon of red wine vinegar and added it, and even though the recipe calls for two tablespoons of olive oil, I put just a little bit over one tablespoon since I didn't have the correct olive oil and I didn't want to throw off the recipe too much if they taste too differently, and I can always add more of this later if it tastes like it needs it. Lastly, I put a generous pinch of salt and a couple of cranks of pepper and stirred it up again. While this is traditionally served with Chilean bread, I just grabbed my favorite tortilla chips and tried it with those. It was really good, but I ended up adding another splash of red wine vinegar and a bit more pepper. Overall, this is such a nice and fresh tasting salsa style recipe, and I'd highly recommend it. Wow, that was a really great opinion and really well said, I assume. Thanks, voiceover Sarah. Don't mention it, video Sarah. Let's move on to beverages. As I said, I ended up making two different beverages for this instead of just one because I felt guilty about only making pebre for the first section, or at least only having footage of me making pebre for the first section. Let's start off with the adult beverage because this is very special in Chile. I went for their national drink, a pisco sour. This was a pretty obvious choice. I know Chile is definitely known for their wine as well, so that could have been a choice, but then I'm not making anything. It would just be me ordering Chilean wine. And I've had plenty of that already. I mean, I've also had plenty of pisco, but <laughs> That's just because I learned about this from Chile. Like Chilean wine, I just like South American wine. That's just my go-to. Actually, you know what I should put this in? This is gonna be stupid, but I'm gonna do it. Just give me a second. I got this wine glass from a winery in Chile. You can kind of see it. Santa Rita Winery in Chile. Um, and it made the flight back as well as through five moves. So I feel like it deserves this moment. This is gonna be a terrible idea, right? Let's do it anyway. I'm so nervous. Okay. Should you be drinking this in the wine glass? Honestly, you can drink it in like a mimosa glass, so. Also known as a champagne glass. So back to Pisco. Pisco is a brandy-like spirit that's made in Chile. However, Pisco is also made in Peru and is huge there as well. But these Piscos are different from each other. They're made from different grapes and also Chilean Pisco can be aged while Peruvian Pisco can't. Also, according to the little bit of research that I did about this, Chilean Pisco is more fruity and floral than the Peruvian Pisco. Not only is there this similarity between Peru and Chile that they both have and make Pisco that are separate from each other, but also both of their national drinks are the Pisco Sour. <laughs> and they both are different recipes made with their different Piscos. <laughs> I just, I find that endlessly fascinating. So although I've actually been to both of these countries, I've only tried Pisco in Chile. I had uh, a straight Pisco, Pisco Sour, and then also Piscola, which I guess we'll talk about as well a little bit. It's just Pisco with Coke, or a different kind of cola, but it's delicious. Also, I think there's like Pisco and Sprite is a thing, but I can't remember what they call it, but that's also delicious. <laughs> Basically, like whenever you add like the lemon or lime flavor to Pisco, mm, so good. But anyways, I can't really compare between Peru and Chile, but Peru is a possibility for a country that I could get in the future on like this Read Around the World series. So eventually I'll be able to compare the two and I will definitely make sure to try the Pisco side by side as well as the Pisco Sour recipes side by side because I'm very curious as to which one I'll like better. Anyways, we're gonna get back to voiceover Sarah and she's going to explain to you how to make a pisco sour recipe from Chile with Chilean pisco to the best of her ability uh, via a recipe she found online. First, the most important ingredient is Chilean pisco. I attempted to show that this was from Chile, but the camera wouldn't focus, so here's a picture I took later that actually shows it. You can use lime or lemon juice. I've done lime pisco sours a lot in the past, so for this time I decided to go for lemon juice. You'll also need some powdered sugar, I keep mine in a jar, and a glass of crushed ice. Technically a fourth of a cup to a half a cup of crushed ice. Really this should be a highball glass or a champagne glass, but I don't own either, so I have a rocks glass here. 
I threw the ice into a cocktail shaker and added the powdered sugar. The recipe calls for one to two tablespoons, so I just did one heaping tablespoon to be somewhere in the middle. I definitely think two would have been too sweet for me personally. Then the best part, I added three ounces of Pisco. Also, I'd like to add a warning here. Pisco is a strong spirit and a Pisco sour is almost all Pisco. So you really want to be careful with this. It can sneak up on you. The taste of Pisco alone is really good. So you add some powdered sugar and citrus to it and it's hard to tell how much alcohol you're actually drinking. So please drink responsibly. Okay, warning over. Then I added one ounce of lemon juice or lime if you're using lime. I put the top of the shaker on and shook until it was cold throughout. The powdered sugar should completely dissolve. Lastly, I poured it out into a glass and took a sip. It was amazing. I should also point out that this isn't the same one that I'm drinking throughout the video. I just made a lazy version because I wanted to start filming, but it's still good, right video, Sarah? Mm. Oh yeah, I completely agree voice over Sarah. This is a great drink. I highly recommend it, but please drink responsibly. Next up, let's get caffeinated. So I don't think that this drink has a specific historical significance in Chile, but I found it on a website that is full of recipes. It's also the recipe I got the pastel de choclo from, or the website that I got the pastel de choclo recipe from. Ugh. And the woman that runs the site is from Chile and she would get this homemade iced coffee recipe all the time from a little coffee shop that was in Santiago. And it just sounded good. It sounded like something that I wanted to make. So that's what's happening. So I'm gonna throw this one right back on over to voiceover Sarah. I haven't made this one yet and it's totally my fault. I didn't have the ice cream yet for it. I like looked at the ingredients list, but for some reason vanilla ice cream just like didn't compute. And so I didn't actually get vanilla ice cream. So I'll be making this later, which I'm very excited to do. Sad that I haven't made it yet, but uh, you know, she slash I will explain to you my feelings on this drink. I assume I'm gonna love it. I mean, it's all the things in it. It sounds so good, so take it away. For this iced coffee, you're going to need a shot of espresso. Thanks to Curtis for making me this one. He even got coffee beans that are from South America for this video. You also need vanilla ice cream and a cup and a half of cold milk, some granulated sugar, and also some whipped cream. You can use heavy cream and whip your own, which is also shown in the recipe that's linked in the description, but I was lazy, so I didn't do that. So first, I added the espresso to the milk and then added in a heaping teaspoon of granulated sugar and stirred. The recipe calls for two teaspoons of sugar, but I don't really like drinks that are too sweet and knowing that there would be ice cream and whipped cream in this as well, I erred on the side of caution and I was really happy with that decision. I set aside the coffee mixture and grabbed a tall glass, then added a scoop of ice cream to it. Or more technically, I added two small scoops of ice cream, but hoped that together they added into one regular size scoop. Then I poured the coffee mixture in. And finally, I topped it with some whipped cream. Not the prettiest job, but it tasted really good, especially once the ice cream got more incorporated. Seriously, this drink just got better and better as I drank it. Oh, another great review by voiceover Sarah. And that closes out this section of the video. So let's get on to books. So I just realized that I haven't taken the thumbnail for this video and um, I wanted to have my drink in it, but now my drink's in a wine glass and it looks a little weird because it's like not wine. But, oh well, I guess. <laughs> so, for this video, for my trip to Chile, I read two books. The House of the Spirits by Isabel Allende and The Savage Detectives by Roberto Bolaño. These definitely took me some time to get through, um, and in the future, I don't know if I'm going to pick books that are this challenging, or like literary fiction, or... I don't know, I just think that these really held up the making of this video because they were tough to get into, they were tough to read thoroughly, and they were just intimidating sitting on my bookshelf and I was like, oh, next month, next month. And I don't want to be doing that for these videos because I'm excited about them, I'm excited for the whole prospect of it, and I don't want those to like hold it, hold it up. So maybe in the future I'll do like one literary fiction that has like some type of historical significance in the country or is like renowned as being this like great book from a uh, author of that country but then like maybe the other one will just be more fun but as long as it has like the atmosphere of the country you know what I mean it's just it was 
it was a lot. <laughs> but let's start with my thoughts on The House of the Spirits because I, I'll have a lot easier time explaining it. This book is about a family across three generations. Our main characters are Clara and Esteban, as well as their daughter Blanca and then later Blanca's daughter Alba. I feel like I typically stay away from these like generational tales that span this large portion of time, but whenever I do read them I really like them. Like the one that sticks out to me the most is Pachinko, which is an, also a great book uh, that is about a family through generations. There's just something about understanding the entire backstory of a character and then watching them navigate their lives and making decisions and they all make sense because you know where they came from. I mean as long as it's done well I guess. All of their decisions make sense to you because you know what their backstory is completely like from birth including what their mother was like and even in Alba's case what her grandmother was like. So it's just kind of cool to know the characters that well and I think that Isabella Allende did a great job in portraying them. Oh and I didn't even mention this book has magic. <laughs> it's a magical realism book and there is magic in it. It's not like magic. <laughs> it's more like spirits and being able to kind of like tell the future a bit or like having premonitions about the future not necessarily like just knowing the future. So nothing seems like outright magical and a lot of the characters don't even believe in magic even though they like see things happen or like there'll be a character that will predict what's going to happen in the future and they'll kind of at the time be like oh yeah okay sure whatever but then it actually happens and they're like, oh my gosh. But they're more like freaked out about the event itself than about the idea that somebody definitely said that this was going to happen. And then uh, the further it gets from that event, the more they've forgotten that it was predicted in the first place. They just remember it for being the traumatic event itself, which I actually think is really realistic. And if there were kind of this little bit of magic on earth, then I think that this is kind of how a lot of people would react. Not everybody reacts that way. Uh, there is one of the family members, he really wishes that he had this magical gift and he practices and practices and tries to kind of get it, but it's it's not really something that works that way. But I thought that that part of it was really like well done because I think that you could kind of look at the book two ways. I think you could either look at it like, oh yeah, magic exists, or look at it and be like, mm, nah. <laughs> like, okay, sure, whatever, magic, okay. Especially when you like view the book through the characters that are kind of just like, oh, her, that's just our aunt. You know, she's not, she's not actually magical. She just talks about spirits a lot. <laughs> Anyways, despite the story being completely character driven, there is a lot more to it than that. Politics plays a huge part in this and I learned a lot actually about Chilean politics because of this book. Not just because of the book itself, but because of what it led me to research and everything. And I found that very fascinating. It's a lot of stuff that I knew absolutely nothing about and the family falls on different viewpoints uh, across this political spectrum that's kind of laid out for you in the book and that also felt very realistic to me that this family would be on opposing sides and actually they like represent kind of the time period that they're from. It, it makes a lot of sense and I think it was done really well. On top of that the book was just well written and I think that it accomplished what I was hoping it would accomplish for this video, which is just that it would give me this Chilean atmosphere and also that I would learn a little bit about Chile. So it was kind of like hitting the jackpot for this book because it's kind of helping me to get to like what the point of even making this video is. Unfortunately, while doing research for this video for uh, the House of the Spirits and Isabella Allende in general, I found out that she actually received a lot of criticism from other Chilean authors and like the famous Chilean authors, not just like people from Chile that were authors, but like the names everybody knows about, including Roberto Bolaño, 
who's the author of the Savage Detectives, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. So Allende is widely considered to be the most famous Latin American female author, contemporary author, and she's won tons of awards but gets the worst criticism from her contemporaries in Chile. Like I said, Roberto Bolaño himself said some pretty negative things, and he was kind of well known for that, like speaking his mind even when it came to very negative opinions. Luckily, Allende seems to kind of take this on the chin, uh, not just for him, but for the other authors that have said negative things about her works, and she kind of just accepts that everybody's allowed to have an opinion and that it's okay if other authors don't like her. I think that that just tends to happen too with getting like more into the contemporary space, and I still wouldn't even call The House of the Spirits like all that contemporary. I mean, I guess technically time-wise it is, like the time it covers, but still it doesn't feel very contemporary. But compared to Bologna, like I guess I understand? I don't know, I think that maybe they just write two very different ways and that they're not really comparable at all. But it makes sense that somebody that writes like Bologna wouldn't like somebody that writes like Allende. I think they're both phenomenal writers but they're just different. But I thought that that was very fascinating because I picked these two books without knowing that the authors said anything about each other at all. So that was quite fascinating. I mean, honestly, Roberto Bolaño in general is like crazy interesting and you should definitely read into him. Okay, <laughs> we've put it off long enough. Let's talk about The Savage Detectives by Roberto Bolaño. Like, where to even begin? <laughs> Like, do you ever get the feeling when you're reading a book that, like, am I too dumb to understand this? Like, is that what the problem is? Because that's the feeling that this book gave me. And, like, oh, well, obviously I don't love that feeling. I don't think that this book, I, like, I don't think it's the book's fault. I honestly think it's my own fault. I'll try to explain that better. And also just to explain the book to the best of my ability. This book is broken out into three parts. It starts off being like incredibly gritty. And I guess actually the whole book is very gritty. I That's just an adjective that makes a lot of sense to me, but it sounds weird now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, but I guess that the whole book is actually pretty gritty, but because the first one, like the first part starts off so much in that vein, it makes the rest seem not quite as on that level. So really this book, instead of being like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it's like sex, drugs, and poetry. <laughs> Part one is from the perspective of 17-year-old Juan Garcia Madero. Okay, I've already tried to say his last name so many times and it always comes out stupid, whether I say it without rolling the R or I say it with attempting to roll the R. So you're just gonna have to forgive me. So it's about Juan and also a group of people called the Visceral Realists. A group of poets, specifically. <laughs> so Juan, being a poet himself, is very excited to find this group of people, which is led by Arturo Bolaño. No, Bolano. Not Bolaño. Bolano. No Enye. And Ulises Lima? Ulises? I think that that's how it's pronounced. I looked it up beforehand and now I'm really second-guessing myself because I've been recording this for over an hour now. <laughs> so it's been a long time since I heard it said out loud in order to prep for this. But uh, I'm gonna refer to them as Bolano and Lima because easier. <laughs> oh, also most of this book takes place in Mexico City and not in Chile, which is my bad. I should have done more research about it. I don't know how... I mean, technically it doesn't say it on the back of the book, but still. I should have I should have looked into that more closely, but I had to read Bolaño, you know, like he's so big in Chile, like I could not read him for this video. So anyways, Juan finds this group of people and he fits right in, although he is experiencing a lot of things that he has not yet experienced, but it's just a group of like-minded people that are really into poetry and so he likes that. What I really like about how Bolaño approached this group of people is that initially they feel very like artistic and romantic and spontaneous, but then as you learn more about them they start to seem more like pretentious or entitled and I think that that's 
I mean, totally valid. But of course, originally you're seeing Juan see this group of people and he's seeing them for the first time. So he thinks that they're just amazing. And then you start to learn more about them and also about Juan himself, who is also a poet. And you're starting to be like, Ugh, they're a little bit pretentious. <laughs> and like, um, so the two people, uh, Bellano and Lima, that are in charge of the group, um, they, well, they all steal books, but then the two of them will like read the books and then explain to them, to the rest of the group, what the books are about so that the rest of the people in the group can like show to the world that they are very well read because they know the plots of these books that they haven't read. I just find that very funny. And also that like books are kind of at this level, but poetry is like to this higher standard and that like poets will start with poetry but then inevitably they'll have to become a writer in order to like pay the bills essentially like that selling out is writing <laughs> in part two we follow um Bellano and lima as they search around for a poet cesario tinajero who had once just like used the term visceral realist and so therefore they want to find her <laughs> So this portion, part two, is told in a different format than part one or part three in that it's more like interviews, or not even really interviews. Like imagine a documentary where you show one person like in a cafe uh, talking in Chile and then you have uh, another one in Spain right after that and they like tell parts of their story and it jumps to the person in Spain and they tell a part of their story and then it jumps back. That's kind of how it was. So it got a little overwhelming um, because there's a lot of people, locations, uh, it's not told in chronological order, <laughs> and it spans 20 years. And there are over 40 perspectives in this, over 40 narrators in part two. So the names started like real, I started struggling so hard with names <laughs> because like some people would just be in there for like two pages would be their full story that they've got about either Lima or Bellano or both of them depending on how like what impact they had in their lives and then somebody else would have like 10 pages but and like keep coming back over and over and so I just didn't even know which names I should try to be like remembering more and their part in the story because I couldn't possibly remember and identify all 40 of them like that would be crazy so like basically what this would look like is kind of their names where they are what year it is maybe what month it is and then they would just like go into their story and it all had to do of course with Bellano and Lima and their travels. Also, there was this part of the book that I really wanted to show you, which I showed when I originally filmed this video, and I had a sticky note there to help me find it when I was filming that time, but then when I put the sticky note back, I just like threw it in the back somewhere instead of putting it back where it should have been. But anyways, the part that I wanted to show you was that there were several pages of a guy that was literally just listing off people that are listed in this directory, and very rarely he would say like, three words about one of the names and like but for the most part it was just like lists of names and I was like why are you doing this to me like am I supposed to recognize any of these names because I don't I don't I mean maybe I should have been keeping notes or something but it was it was just it was a lot anyways overall seeing these different perspectives from these people about Bellano and Lima you get kind of the same feel that you did at the end of part one where they're a little bit pretentious, they're a little bit elitist, but honestly, most of the people like them anyways. Uh, they kind of just like take that with their personality and they enjoy being around them for the most part. That's how it seemed to me anyways. Oh, one of my favorite parts was uh, when Bellano gets into a sword fight with this critic because he's worried about a negative review he's going to write. And you get to see it from like several different perspectives because like different people were there and you're like jumping between these narrators and it was, it was just hilarious. I thought that that was so funny that he gets like in a literal sword fight and everybody that's involved in the situation is like, wait, what, really? Are you like, what? <laughs> like, sure, like I'll come to be your backup. But like, what are you talking? Why are you doing this? So lastly, part three picks up back at where we were at the end of part one, which is in 1976, by the way, 
Um, part two goes from 76 to 96, but then the first part and the third part are both set in 76. So we jump back to 76 from, again, Juan's perspective, and uh, he is starting this journey that Lima and Bellano are going to go on, but they're going to separate from them. And then also Lupe, another character, is with them in the car. So it's like the four of them in a car traveling. Bellano and Lima end up leaving off. They're all looking for Cesario, the uh, poet. And then we get a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of Juan and Lupe at the end and like kind of their story towards the end of the book. I'm not going to dive too much into that. So overall this book was a huge challenge for me. It was incredibly dense to read, not just in the way the story felt or like the writing style in general, but in actually the way that it's printed. It's a very small uh, font, it's very thin pages, and Overall, it just gives you this feeling like you're reading it forever, like it's a never-ending book, which I know shouldn't play a part in how I feel about the story and the writing that's in the book, but it does. Like, it does. At least for me, it does. And I like to know those things about books, so I'm sharing that with you. And there would be so many times where for an entire page spread of the book, there would just be like no, par no uh, paragraph breaks. And once again, I know that's a silly thing to be like talking about in a review of this book, but those are the kinds of things that get to me, like not having a break in thought or in what's going on. I just felt overwhelmed the whole time. And I don't even think I fully understand the book. I felt like I could have read it five more times and I would have to have done that in order to even get a little bit of the understanding. Like I'd have to do that in its original language. I'd have to do it in Spanish in order to fully get what was going on. It was just, it was tough for me. It was a tough book for me. Do I think it was well written? Absolutely. Like it's very clear that the writing is very good in this book. I can totally understand why Bolaño is such a big deal. It's just that it was a struggle for me personally. I think that the grander theme, if I understand it correctly, is an interesting one. That things may seem more like romantic from the outside, but then when you really get down to it, maybe it's more a bit of a mess. I'm always fascinated by characters that tend to romanticize things, but I think that this book does a good job of like romanticizing as a whole, like this group of people, this like movement, and then deconstructing it. Like I think that that is definitely evident and you can see that through different perspectives from different people's points of view from Juan himself when he first meets the visceral realists. And so I think that that's pretty cool. Also there's some like <laughs> weird like conceptual drawings in this that are neat. And I definitely appreciated those portions of the book. But who knows? It's possible that I didn't understand this book at all. And there's definitely things that I didn't talk about that are in this book. Uh, like the fact that I guess it's slightly autobiographical for Bolaño. I mean, there is a character named Bolano, so I assume that that's where it comes from. But I'm not totally sure. So I'm going to link to specifically an article and a video that were big for me in understanding the parts that I didn't fully understand initially, um, and I, I still don't feel like I do, but they helped a little bit. So if you'd like to get more of that insight, like I just didn't want to talk about concepts that I wasn't aware of and didn't understand while reading the book because that felt very disingenuous to like the reading experience that I had. Um, but if you do want to hear about those things, then I'm going to leave those links in the description. I highly recommend checking those out, especially if you've already read the book and you just want to read more about it. So do I think that The Savage Detectives was the right book to choose for this video? No, honestly I don't. I think that I should have picked up a different Bolaño book and I do plan on reading a uh, another novella that he published called By Night in Chile even though you know this video will be done and out because it sounds really good and it sounds like something I'm interested in. But overall like I'm glad I read The Savage Detectives. It's made me think long after finishing it and honestly that's just the highest compliment I think I can give a book. Whew, okay so we got through those three first parts of this video. There's just one part left and it's to talk about my experience in Chile so this should be easier. I'm going to try not to talk about it for too long. Uh, one because it's not really the point of this video. 
And um, two, I don't know how interesting it's gonna be. Maybe this is more for me than it is for you. I don't know. Also, I'm pretty sure this video is already very long already. Anyways, so I went to Chile in 2016 with some friends for a wedding. Friends of ours were getting married in Chile. Uh, the bride herself was from Chile, which is why they were doing a family wedding there. So any of the friends that were traveling from the US to attend the wedding went together and we made like a whole trip out of it. We stayed there for longer than we needed to in order to both go to the wedding and then also just to see Chile in general. So we were able to, the first couple of nights, stay with the bride's family in Santiago uh, outside of downtown and which was really cool because we could kind of experience it from that way and like having home-cooked meals which was just awesome. Uh, but we were able to do that before like the wedding craziness started and you know they obviously had other people staying at their house. So we stayed in Santiago for a few nights, we explored a bit, we mostly went to wineries. I mean look at that creepy little face looking at that wine. <laughs> so excited. Then we went to San Pedro de Atacama in the Atacama Desert, which is like right up against the Andes Mountains. This was absolutely beautiful. We stayed in a little hostel in San Pedro and we got to go to the Valley of the Moon and the Valley of Death and um, to El Tatio, which is the third largest geyser, uh, what is it called? The third largest geyser field in the world and the largest one in South America or no in the southern hemisphere obviously South America but like the southern hemisphere we froze our asses off to see that actually because we had to get there before sunrise and we all bought hats they must make a killing on selling hats to tourists oh also we went sandboarding which was actually my second time going sandboarding I know I'm very cool. But let me go ahead and lower back down that opinion you have of me by showing you this video of a video of me sandboarding. In my defense, it felt a lot faster than it looks. <laughs> then we went back to Santiago for the actual wedding, but we stayed in downtown this time in an Airbnb. This gave us the opportunity to actually explore the city a little bit more because we could just walk around to places. Oh my gosh, great food great wine, of course. Uh, we actually also did a day trip to Valparaiso, which now that I'm thinking about it, might have been before we went to San Pedro. I can't remember if it was before or after, but either way, the visit to Valparaiso was incredible. I fell in love with that city. Like seriously, I was looking up listings in Valparaiso. I was ready to like move there for a few months. I actually have a painting that I bought off the street in Valparaiso, which I then carried with me all day and then, you know, eventually on the flight back to the US on two different flights and three different airports, carrying this painting and like sliding it between my seat and the window on the plane to keep it safe because it wouldn't fit in my suitcase. I was so happy I did though because it remains to be my favorite uh, artwork that I have at all. It's in the living room, but I'll put a picture of what it looks like. Also, I got this little thing in Valparaiso as well. It's just got like a little funicular in it. Um, it says Chile on the top. Ooh. Nope. Read right the first time. I can read. <laughs> That's good on a booktube channel. Uh, but yeah, very cute. Um, this usually lives in my bookshelf, but got it down for this. Oh, and of course the wedding itself was so much fun. I mean, I've never been able to like go to another country and go to a wedding in that country, but it's it was great. The music, the dancing, it was just the best. Lastly though, one of the coolest parts about the trip was that we were on it during the Copa Americana, which if you don't know, is the oldest international football or soccer <laughs> tournament that's international. Did I say international already? Did I say international twice during that sentence? Nah. So that actually started in 1916. It's over 100 years old, that tournament, which is crazy. Um, so typically it's been a South American only tournament, but since the 1990s, no, since 1990, I think the year itself, it's, uh, they've also invited North American countries as well as Asian countries. During the year that I was there, 2016, the US was actually hosting it. And it was the first time it was hosted outside of South America, which is kind of cool. Although, you know, I was obviously in South America, so. And also the US were in the tournament that year. Um, 
and they got fourth place, which is awesome. We saw them lose that last match that they were in while in San Pedro in a bar. Uh, so that was sad, but I'm sure that that provided some good entertainment for the people that were around us watching these very clearly Americans. We were wearing like American soccer, football jerseys. I mean, yeah, it was clear that we were like invested in the game and we were American, um, but we did lose that game. So that was unfortunate. But fourth place overall is still pretty good, especially, you know, for our team. But what was even cooler than that was that we were able to see two games that Chile played in while we were there. Uh, one we got to see while staying in the bride's home of like the wedding we were going to. So that was cool because we were like in a more family setting, like just in a living room hanging out watching the game. And later we were able to see another game in a bar, which I actually have a clip of. Like, please don't judge my voice. I sound very silly in this. So we got to see both those games, which Chile won, of course, both of those, and uh, unfortunately the final game that was being played against their rival Argentina was going to be happening while we were on the flight back to the US. However, on the plane, some guy was able to get the game up on his phone and have like a live feed of it. And a bunch of people just started to kind of like huddle around him in order to try to see this game as it goes into penalty kicks. So Chile actually ends up winning this game uh, four to two in penalty kicks uh, against Argentina for the 2016 Copa Americana and everybody on the plane goes wild. You'll have to once again ignore my voice for this clip. And one guy takes out a Chilean flag from his bag in the overhead bin and he starts like running down the aisle with it flapping behind him cape style. And the pilot comes on over the speakers and I'm expecting him to say something and be like, okay, everybody like settle down. But instead he relays the score and what happened in the game and celebrates along with us over the speaker that Chile won the Copa Americana that year. It was so cool and it took me forever to find that clip, but I had to. If not just for this video, then for me to be able to see it again, because honestly, this is one of my favorite memories ever. I was so sad that we were going to miss out on the experience of watching the game like in a bar or something in Chile when it was the final game, but this was so much cooler. Like, just the excitement that was there and the pilot wanting to join in on it. I just really loved it. Anyways, now I'm going to cut to a clip from when I originally filmed this video of me randomly selecting what the next two uh, countries might be, or like what the next country might be between two choices. You get it. I'm gonna cut to that now. So basically how this works is I have a list of 35 now countries started at 36 but obviously Chile is off the list now and so I'm going to randomly generate a number twice to get two different countries and then that will be a poll on my Instagram that will then determine which country I go to next with like books and everything. I've got my little like list here which you can't see uh, that has got everything like in a spreadsheet so that everything's numbered. But then I also need to open up a random number generator. So let's go one through 35 and generate. 12, should I be showing you this? I'm sorry, 12. And to go back over, 12 is Peru. <laughs> we just go a little bit north. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, let's see what the other one is. I'm not gonna say that I have a preference, but I was hoping that it would be jumping around the world a little bit more than just like Chile, Peru. All right, um, so now I'm doing one through 34 because technically Peru is not on the list. You get it. Generate 30, which would actually be 31 on my list because I'm not counting Peru. Belgium, okay. So we've got Peru or Belgium. So that's right, I actually got Peru as a possibility, which is hilarious because 
Um, it would be funny to like do that one and be able to try out like their Pisco and their Pisco Sour. And also I was there the year before I was in Chile for Copa Americana 2015. <laughs> So that's funny. So basically I could either travel slightly north to Peru or over to Europe and into Belgium, which I have never been to. So that would also be really, really cool. And I feel like I'd have to bake something for that, right? Instead of like making just a dish, I feel like I'd want a baked good from Belgium. But that's a decision that I might not have to make anytime soon because it totally depends on who you guys vote for, who, which country you guys vote for in my Instagram story, which is going to be up for the 24 hours after this video goes live. So if you're watching this then, make sure to go and vote. If you're watching it afterwards, it'll be on like the permanent stories area on Instagram, like on my Instagram page. So you can see who won at least there. As for this video, I think it's time to close out our imaginary trip to Chile. It's been fun. It's been real. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> but I hope that you had fun and that you enjoyed this video. Um, if you've got any suggestions for books I should read from Belgium or Peru, please do let me know in the description or meals I should make from them or drinks, you know, whatever. But anyways, um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider subscribing and I will see you in the next one. Adios!